Section 9 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4, Claudius, A.D. 41 to 54, Part 1. Few credited at first the tidings of the death of Gaius. Many thought the story was only spread by him in some mad freak to test their feelings, and so they feared to show either grief or joy. When at last they found that it was true, and that Caesonia and his child were also murdered, they noted in their gossip that all the Caesars who bore the name of Gaius had died a violent death, and then they waited quietly to see what the Senate and the soldiers thought of doing. The Senate met at once in the capital, where the consuls summoned to their guard the cohorts of the watch, there with the memorials of the past the tokens of ancient freedom round them they could take counsel with becoming calmness and dignity the emperor was dead and there seemed no claimant with a title to the throne should they venture to elect a sovereign regardless of the warnings of the past or should they set up a commonwealth once more and breathe fresh life into the shadowy forms about them the discussion lasted all that day, and the night passed without a final vote. But it was all idle talk, for the Praetorians, meanwhile, had made their choice. The tidings of the emperor's death soon reached the camp, and drew the soldiers to the city. Too late to defend or even to avenge their sovereign, they dispersed in quest of booty and roamed through the palace at their will. One of the plunderers, passing by the alcove of a room, espied the feet of someone hidden behind the half-closed curtains curious to see who it might be he dragged him out and recognized the face of claudius the late emperor's uncle he showed him to his comrades who were near and possibly in jest they saluted him as their new prince raised him at once upon their shoulders and carried him in triumph to the camp the citizens who saw him carried by marked his piteous look of terror and thought the poor wretch was carried to his doom. The Senate heard that he was in the camp, but only sent to bid him take his place among them, and heard seemingly without concern that he was there detained by force. But the next day found them in a different mood. The populace had been clamoring to have a monarch, the Praetorians had sworn obedience to their new-found emperor, the city guards had slipped away, and the Senate, divided and disheartened, had no course left them but submission. Tiberius Claudius Nero Germanicus, the son of Drusus, grandson of Livia Augusta, suffered in early years from lingering diseases which left him weak both in body and in mind. The Romans commonly had little tenderness for sickly children. Antonia and his mother even spoke of him as a monster, as a thing which nature had rough-hewn but never finished, while his grandmother would not deign to speak to him except by messenger or letter. Though brought up in the palace, he was little cared for, was left to the tender mercies of a muleteer, of whose rough usage he spoke bitterly in after life, and even when he came to manhood was not allowed to show himself in public life or hope for any of the offices of state. We may still read the letters written by Augustus to his wife in which he speaks of him as too imbecile for any public functions, too awkward and ungainly to take a prominent place even in the circus at the show. The only honor which he gave him was a place in the priesthood of the augurs, and at his death he left him a very paltry legacy. Nor did Tiberius think more highly of him. He gave him only the poor grace of consular ornaments, and when he asked to have the consulship itself, his uncle took no further notice than to send him a few gold pieces to buy good cheer with in the holidays. His nephew Gaius made him consul, but encouraged the rough jest with which his courtiers bantered him. If he came late among the guests at dinner, they shifted their seats and shouldered him away till he was tired of looking for an empty place. If he fell asleep as was his wont, they plastered up his mouth with olives or put shoes upon his hands that he might rub his eyes with them when he woke. He was sent by the Senate into Germany to congratulate the emperor on his supposed successes, but Gaius took it ill 
and thought the choice of him was such a slight that he had the deputation flung into the river. Ever after he was the very last to be asked in the Senate for his vote, and when he was allowed to be one of the new priests, the office was saddled with such heavy fees that his household goods had to be put up to auction to defray them. After such treatment from his kinsmen, it was no wonder that he sunk into coarse and vulgar ways, indulged his natural liking for low company, ate largely and drank hardly, and turned to dice for his amusement. Yet he had also tastes of a much higher order, kept Greeks of literary culture round him, studied hard and with real interest, and at the advice of the historian Livy took to writing history himself. His first choice of subject was ambitious, for he tried to deal with the troubled times that followed Julius Caesar's death, but he was soon warned to leave so dangerous a theme. He wrote also largely on the history of Etruria and Carthage, and later authors often used the materials collected by or for him. Of the latter of the two works we read that a courtly club was formed at Alexandria to read it regularly through aloud from year to year. Such was the man who in his fiftieth year was raised to the empire by a soldier's freak to rule in name, but to be in fact the puppet of his wives and freedmen. These were the real governors of the world, and their intrigues and rivalries and lust and greed have left their hateful stamp upon his reign. The freedmen had for a long time played an important part in the domestic life of Rome, for the household slaves that were so numerous at this time in every family of ample means could look commonly for freedom after some years of faithful service, though their old master still had legal claims upon them, and custom and old associations bound them to their patron and his children. They haunted the houses of the wealthy, filled all the offices of trust, and ministered to their business and pleasures. Among them there were many men of refinement and high culture, natives of Greece and Asia, at least as well educated as their masters, and useful to them in a hundred ways, as stewards, secretaries, physicians, poets, confidants, and friends. The emperor's household was organized like that of any noble. Here, too, there were slaves for menial work, and freedmen for the posts of trust. The imperial position was too new and ill-defined, the temper of the people too republican as yet, for men of high social rank and dignity to be in personal attendance in the palace. Offices like those of high steward, chamberlain, great seal, and treasurer to the monarch had the stigma of slavery still branded on them, and were not such as noblemen could covet. But these were already posts of high importance, and much of the business of state was already in the freedmen's hands. For by the side of the Senate and the old curule officers of the Republic, the Empire had set up, both in the city and the provinces, a new system of administrative machinery, of which the Emperor was the center and mainspring. To issue instructions, check accounts, receive reports, and keep the needful registers became a daily increasing burden, and many skillful servants soon were needed to be in constant attendance in the palace. The funeral inscriptions of the time show that the official titles in the imperial household were becoming rapidly more numerous as the functions were more and more subdivided. When the ruler was strong and self-contained, his servants took their proper places as valets de chambre, ushers, and clerks, while a privileged few were confidential agents and advisers. When he was inexperienced or weak, they took the reins out of his hands and shamefully abused their power. Much too low in rank to have a political career before them, they were not weighted with the responsibilities of power and could not act like the cabinet ministers of modern Europe. The theory of the Constitution quite ignored them, and they were only creatures of the Emperor, who was not the fountain of honor, like later kings, and could not make them noble if he would. As high ambitions were denied them, and they could not openly assert their talents, they fell back commonly on lower aims and meaner arts. They lied and intrigued and flattered to push their way to higher place. They used their power to gratify a greedy avarice or sensual lust. 
wealth was their first and chief desire and their master's confidence once gained riches flowed in upon them from all sides to get easy access to the sovereign's ear was a privilege which all were glad to buy the suitors who came to ask a favour a post of profit or of honour the litigants who feared for the goodness of their cause and wished to have a friend at court vassal princes eager to stand well in the emperor's graces town councillors longing for some special boon or for relief from costly burdens provincials of every class and country ready to buy at any cost the substantial gift of roman franchise hundreds such as these all sought the favourite in the antechamber and schemed and trafficked for his help there was no time to be lost indeed for a monarch's favour is an unstable thing and shrewd adventurers like themselves were ever plotting to displace them at any moment they might be disgraced so they grasped every chance that brought them gain and speedily amassed colossal fortunes men told a story at the time with glee that when claudius complained of scanty means a bystander remarked that he would soon be rich enough if two of his favourite freedmen would admit him into partnership now for the first time the personal attendants take a prominent place in public thought and history is forced to note their names and chronicle their doings and the story of their influence passes from the scandalous gossip of the palace to the pages of the gravest writers in the days of his obscurity they had shared the meaner fortunes of their master enlivened his dullness by their wit and catered for his literary tastes they had provided theories of style and learning and research though they could not give him sense to use them and now they were doubtless eager to help their patron to make history not to write it greedily they followed him to the palace and swooped upon the empire as their prey two of his old companions towered above all the rest pallas and narcissus the former had been with claudius from childhood and filled the post of keeper of the privy purse or steward of the imperial accounts in such a post with such a master it was easy for him to enrich himself and he did not neglect his opportunities but his pride was even more notable than his wealth he would not deign to speak even to his slaves but gave them his commands by gestures or if that was not enough by written orders his arrogance did not even spare the nobles in the senate but they well deserved such treatment by their servile meanness the younger pliny tells us some years afterwards how it moved his spleen to find in the official documents that the senate had passed a vote of thanks to pallas and a large money grant in that he had declined the gift and said he would be content with modest poverty if only he could be still of dutiful service to his lord a modest poverty of many millions narcissus was the emperor's secretary and as such familiar alike with state secrets and with his master's personal concerns he was always at his side to jog his memory and guide his judgment in the senate at the law courts in cabinet council at the festive board nothing could be done without his knowledge in most events of moment his influence may be traced men chafed no doubt at the presumption of the upstart and told with malicious glee of the retort made by the freedmen of the conspirator camillus who when examined in the council chamber by narcissus and asked what he would have done himself if his master had risen to the throne answered i should have known my place and held my tongue behind his chair they heard with pleasure too that when he went on a mission to the mutinous soldiery in britain and tried to harangue them from their general's tribune they would not even listen to him but drowned his voice with the songs of the saturnalia the festive time at rome when the slaves kept holiday and took their masters places but at rome none dared to be so bold though his influence at court stirred the jealousy of many who whispered to each other that it was no wonder he grew rich so fast when he made so much by peculation out of the great works which he prompted claudius to undertake and one of which at least the outlet for the lucrine lake caused almost a public scandal by its failure after them came polybius whose literary skill had often served his patron in good stead and gave him constant access to his ear no sinister motives can be traced to him 
at worst we hear that he was vain and thought himself on a level with the best and liked to take the air with a consul at each side he had cool impudence enough we read for in the theatre when the people pointed at him as they heard a line about a beggar on horseback who was hard to brook he quoted at once another line from the same poet of the kings that had risen from a low estate callistus lent to the newcomers in the palace his long experience of the habits of a court he had served under the last ruler could suit his ways to please a new master so unlike the old and soon took a high place among the ruling clique by his tact and knowledge of the world of rome felix too whom we read of in the story of st paul gained possibly through his brother pallas the post of governor of judea but must have had rare qualities to marry as suetonius tells us three queens in succession posides was the soldier of the party his military powers shown in the sixteen days campaign of claudius in britain raised him above other generals in his master's eyes like his stately buildings which juvenal mentions as outtopping the capital there is no need to carry on the list these are only the most favoured of the party the best endowed with natural gifts the most trusted confidants of caesar the first care of the new government was to reassure the public mind Chirea and his accomplices must die indeed for the murder of an emperor was a fatal thing to overlook and they were said to have threatened the life of claudius himself for all besides there was a general amnesty marked deference was shown by the new ruler to the senate and the bold words latterly spoken by its members were unnoticed few honours were accepted in his own name while the statues of gaius were withdrawn from public places his acts expunged from all official registers and his claims to divine honours ignored as those of tiberius had been before the people were kept in good humour by the public shows and merry-makings as the soldiers had been by the promise of fifteen hundred sesterces a man and so the new reign began amid signs of general contentment the next care of the little clique was to keep their master in good humour to flatter his vanities and gratify his tastes while they played upon his weakness and governed in his name this they did for years with rare success thanks to their intimate knowledge of his character and to the harmony that prevailed among themselves he had all the coarse romans love for public games was never weary of seeing gladiators fight so they helped him to indulge his tastes and make merry with the populace of rome as the common round of spectacles was not enough new shows must be lavishly provided from the early morning till the entertainment closed he was always in his seat eager to see the cages of the wild beasts opened and to lose nothing of the bloody sport the spectators could always see him with his wagging head and the broad grin upon his slobbering mouth could hear him often crack his poor jokes on what went on sometimes noting with amusement how he hurried with his staggering legs across the arena to coax or force the reluctant gladiators to resume their deadly work they noted also that he had the statue of augustus first veiled and then removed from the scene of bloodshed as if the cruel sport that amused the living must offend the saintly dead he was fond also of good cheer so fond of it that he sometimes lost sight of his dignity one day as he sat upon the judgment seat he smelt the savour of a burnt offering in a temple close at hand and breaking up the court in haste he hurried to take his seat at dinner with the priests at another time in the senate when the discussion turned on licensing the public houses he gravely spoke about the merits of the different wine shops where he had been treated in old days so feasting was the order of the day great banquets followed one upon the other and hundreds of guests were bidden to his table at which few ate or drank so freely or so coarsely as himself but he had more royal taste than these for he aspired to be a sort of solomon upon the seat of justice as magistrate or as assessor by the curule chair or in the senate when grave cases were debated he would sit for hours listening to the pleaders or examining the witnesses sometimes showing equity and insight sometimes so frivolous and childish in his comments that litigants and lawyers lost their patience altogether 
as the father of the people it seemed one of his first cares to find his children bread and no little time and thought were spent by him or by his agents in seeing that the granaries were filled and the markets well supplied yet the poor were not always grateful for once when prices rose they crowded in upon him in the forum and pelted him with hard words and crusts of bread till he was glad to slink out by a back door to his palace for his was certainly the familiarity that breeds contempt his presence speech and character were too ungainly and undignified to impose respect and even in his proclamations his advisers let him air his folly to the world sometimes he spoke in them about his personal foibles confessed that he had a hasty temper but that it soon passed away and said that in years gone by he had acted like a simpleton to disarm the jealousy of gaius then again he put out public edicts as full of household cures and recipes as the talk of any village gossip End of section nine Section ten of Roman History The Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter four Claudius AD forty one to fifty four Part two Claudius had little taste for military exploits, yet once it was thought prudent to excite his martial ardor that he might have the pleasure of a real triumph, like the commanders of old days at the crisis of a campaign in britain when the preparations had been made for victory the general sent to summon claudius to the seat of war all had been done to make the journey pleasant the carriage even had been specially arranged to make it easy for him to while away the time by the games of dice which he loved so well and though the waves and winds were not so complacent or so regardful of his comforts he reached at last the distant island in time to receive the submission of the native princes and to be hailed as emperor on the battlefield meanwhile the freedmen reaped their golden harvest having early agreed upon a common course of action they divided the spoil without dispute they trafficked in the offices of state bestowed commissions in the army and sold the verdicts of the law courts and put up the emperor's favour to the highest bidder one privilege which millions craved the citizenship of rome was above all a source of income to the favoured freemen who could get their master's signature to any deed he has indeed in history the credit of a liberal policy of incorporation and speeches are put into his mouth in which he argues from the best precedents of earlier days in favour of opening the doors to alien races it may be that his study of the past had taught him something but it is likely that the interest of his ministers did more to further a course which in their hands was so lucrative a form of jobbery it was a common jest to say that the market was so overstocked at last that the franchise went for a mere song but these after all were petty gains and they needed a more royal road to wealth they found it in a new kind of proscription they marked out for death and confiscation those who had houses or gardens which they coveted made out the rich men to be malcontents and the city to be full of traitors it was easy to work upon the emperor's fears for he had always been an abject craven and was always fancying hidden daggers a telling story a mysterious warning or a dream invented for the purpose almost anything could throw him off his balance and make him give the fatal order nor did they always wait for that one day a centurion came to give in his report he had in pursuance of his orders killed a man of consular rank claudius had never known of it before but approved the act when he heard the soldiers praised for being so ready to avenge their lord when the list was made out in later times it was believed that thirty-five members of the senate and some three hundred knights fell as victims to the caprice or greed of the clique that governed in the name of claudius many of them without any forms of justice or at best with the hurried mockery of a trial in the palace so fatal to a people may be the weakness of its rulers it was noticed as a scandalous proof of his recklessness in bloodshed that he soon forgot even what had passed 
and bade the very men to supper whose death warrant he had signed and wondered why they were so late in coming the guilt of these atrocities must be shared also by his wives of these claudius married several in succession but two especially stand out in history for the horror of all times messalina's name has passed into a byword of unbounded wantonness without disguise or shame her fatal influence ruined or degraded all she touched the pictures painted of her in old writers give no redeeming feature in her character no single unselfish aim or mental grace nothing but sensual appetites in a form of clay her beauty gained her an easy command over her husband's heart but not content with that her wanton fancy ranged through every social order and shrank from no impure advances some whom she tempted had repelled her in their virtue or disgust but her slighted love soon turned to hatred and on one false plea or other she took the forfeit of their lives for she had no scruples or compunction no shrinking from the sight of blood and pity if she ever felt it was with her only a mere passing thrill a counter irritant to other feelings of the flesh the roman jezebel coveted we read the splendid gardens of lucullus and to get them had a lying charge of treason brought against valerius asiaticus their owner his defence was so pathetic as to move all those who heard him in the emperor's chamber and to make even messalina weep but as she hurried out to dry her tears she whispered to her agent who stood beside that for all this the accused must not escape for a long time she was wise enough to court or humour the confederates of the palace and so far her course of crime was easy at last she threw off such restraints of prudence turned upon polybius who had taken her favours in too serious a mood and rid herself for ever of his ill-timed jealousy the other freedman took his fate as a warning of defiance to them all looked for a struggle of life and death and watched their opportunity to strike the chance soon came for messalina cast her lustful eyes on a young noble and did not scruple to parade her insolent contempt for claudius by forcing silius to a public marriage it was the talk of the whole town but the emperor was the last to know it then narcissus saw the time was come and though the rest wavered he was firm in concert with his confidants he opened the husband's eyes and worked skilfully upon his fears with dark warnings about plots and revolution prevented any intercourse between them lest her wiles and beauty might prove fatal to his schemes and at last boldly ordered her death while claudius gave no sign and asked no question she died in the gardens of lucullus purchased so lately by the murder of their owner the emperor soon after made a speech to his guards upon the subject bemoaned his sorry luck in marriage and told them they might use their swords upon him if he ever took another wife but his freedmen knew him better and were already in debate upon the choice of a new wife callistus pallas and narcissus each had his separate scheme in view and the rival claims broke up the old harmony between them the choice of pallas fell on agrippina the daughter of germanicus and niece of claudius married at the age of twelve to gnaeus domitius ahenobarbus a man of singular ferocity of temper she had brought him a son who was to be one day famous she had been foully treated by caligula her brother and banished to an island till his death recalled by claudius she learnt prudence from the fate of the two julii sister and cousin who fell victims to the jealousy of messalina she shunned all dangerous rivalry at court and was content to exchange her widowhood for the quiet country life of a new husband one of the richest men in rome who dying shortly after left domitius his heir and gave her back her freedom when the time was come for her to use it her first care was to gain a powerful ally at court she found one soon in pallas who was as proud and ambitious as herself and she stooped to be the mistress of a minion while aspiring to be an emperor's wife when pallas pleaded for her to the council chamber where the merits of the different claimants were long and anxiously discussed she did not spare to use her feminine wiles upon the weak old man 
by right of kinship she had a ready access to the palace and could lavish her caresses and her blandishments upon him the fort besieged so hotly fell at once and she was soon his wife in all but name for a while he seemed to waver at the thought of shocking public sentiment by a marriage with his niece but those scruples were soon swept aside by the courtly entreaties of the senate and the clamour of a hired mob agrippina showed at once that she meant to be regent as well as wife she grasped with a firm hand the reins of power still relied upon the veteran statecraft and experience of pallas and maintaining with him the old intrigue broke up the league of the confederates the feminine rivals whose influence she feared were swept aside by banishment or death lalia above all had crossed her path and seemed likely to carry off the prize she did not rest till the order was given for her death and a centurion dispatched to bring her head then so runs the horrid story to make sure that the ghastly face was really that of the beautiful woman she had feared and hated she pushed up the pallid lips to feel the teeth whose form she knew then she felt that she was safe and received the title of augusta from the senate she had the doings of her court reported in the official journals of the day and gave the law to all the social world of rome two children of claudius by messalina britannicus and octavia stood in the path of her ambition of these the latter was at once betrothed to her young son who was pushed forward rapidly in the career of honours ennobled even with proconsular authority and styled prince of the youth even in his seventeenth year meantime the star of the young britannicus was paling and men noted with suspicion that all the trusted guards and servants of the boy were one by one removed and their places filled with strangers of the freedmen of the palace narcissus only had not bowed before her with gloomy look and ill-concealed suspense he still watched over his patron and his children his strength of character and long experience gave him a hold over his master that was still unshaken and agrippina did not dare to attack him face to face but his enmity was not to be despised he had sealed the doom of one wife he might yet destroy another there was something to alarm her also in the mood of claudius weak dotard as he was for strange words fell from him in his drunken fits coupled with maudlin tenderness for his own children and suspicious looks at nero there seemed no time therefore to be lost and she decided to act promptly she seized the opportunity when narcissus was sent away to take the waters for the gout and while his watchful eye was off her she called to her aid the skill of the poisoner locusta and gave claudius the fatal dose in the savoury dish he loved scarcely was he dead when seneca wrote for the amusement of the roman circles a withering satire on the solemn act by which he was raised to the rank of the immortals in a medley of homely prose and lofty verse he pictures the scene above at the moment of the emperor's death mercury had taken pity on his lingering agony and begged clotho one of the three fates to cut short his span of life she tells him that she was only waiting till he had made an end of giving the full franchise to the world already by his grace greeks and gauls spaniards and britons wore the toga and only a few remnants were still left uncared for but at length she let loose the struggling soul then the scene shifts to heaven jupiter is told that a stranger has just come hobbling in a bald old man who wagged his head so much and spoke so thick that no one could make out his meaning for it did not sound like greek or roman or any sort of civilized speech hercules as being used to monsters is deputed to ask him whence he comes and he does this as a greek in words of homer claudius glad to find scholars up in heaven who may perhaps think well of his own works of history caps the quotation with another about a journey made from troy and might have imposed on the simple-minded god if the goddess fever had not come up at the moment from the roman shrine where she is worshipped and said that he was only born at lugdunum in the country of the old gauls who like himself had taken the capital by storm claudius in his anger made the usual gesture by which he ordered men's heads off their shoulders but no one minded him any more than if they had been his own proud freedmen 
so remembering that he could not strut and crow any more on his own dunghill he begs hercules to befriend him and to plead his cause in the council chamber of the gods this he does with some effect and when the debate opens most of the speakers seem inclined to let claudius come in but at length augustus rises and with energy denounces his successor who had shed so much noble blood like water and murdered so many of the family of the caesars without a trial or hearing his speech and vote decide the question and claudius is dragged away to hades with a noose about his throat like the victims of his cruelty as he passes on his way through rome his funeral dirge is being sung and he hears the snatches of it which mentioned in his praise that no one ever was so speedy on the seat of judgment or could decide so easily after hearing one side only or sometimes neither and that pleaders and gamblers would keenly feel the loss of a monarch who had loved so much the law court and the dice box the spirits in hades raise a shout of triumph when they hear that he is near and all whom he had sent before him throng about him as he enters there they stand the intimates the kinsmen he had doomed to death the senators the knights and less honoured names as countless as the sands on the seashore and silently confront the fallen tyrant but claudius seeing all the well-known faces forgetting as he often did in life or even ignorant of the causes of their death said why here are all friends how ever came you hither then they curse him to his face and drag him to the chair of aeacus the judge who condemns him unheard to the surprise of all save the criminal himself after some thought a fitting penalty was found claudius was doomed to play for all eternity with a dice box that had no bottom end of section 10